that time, not when it is. I'm totally out of focus. Better. All right, so um, Social Contract um, was published only a few years after the Discourse on Inequality. Um, different inequalities. Um, 1759. The social contract was published in 1762. So it's just like three years later. Um, you yeah, know, I mean, I guess really three years is, is enough time to change your mind about everything <laughs> depending on what's going on but um but still it's it is a little bit surprising um coming from the discourse when you start reading the social contract it seems like everything has changed um but like as i hinted last time i'm not sure there's as much conflict as there appears to be um so of course like the main thing that seems to have changed is that now he sounds really positive about civil society. I mean, except for that, like one very famous line at the at the very beginning, right, where he says, "Man is everywhere in chains." That man was born free, but is everywhere in chains. That doesn't sound that positive. <laughs> but then, as he goes on, he like um, starts talking about how great this is. Um, but um, I think if you look at what he says carefully, you'll see that there's maybe not as much conflict as might appear because he's clearly in the social contract, he's talking about some kind of ideal case. So, um, like in one page 167, this, so this is book one, chapter eight. Um, he talks about how, how much better human beings are in this new uh, civil state than they were in the state of nature. And he says, um, if the abuse of this, if this, if the abuse of this new condition did not often lower his condition to beneath the level he left, he ought constantly to bless the happy moment that tore him away from it forever and that transformed him from a stupid limited animal into an intelligent being and a man. So the, I think the key part there is the if. If the abuse of this new condition did not often lower his condition to beneath the level he left, um, but uh, often it does, perhaps almost always, right? So in the social contract, he's talking about like, um, um, how great it would be if what usually happens didn't happen and it didn't get abused to the point that it made people worse off than they were in the state of nature. Um, and he will say later on in the social contract that there have been very few properly constituted states. So he's, de so he's definitely not talking about the usual case. And again, Sparta is going to come back as an example of what he's talking about as a, in addition to the Roman Republic. Um, and maybe Athens sometimes seems to come up as well, depending on what mood he's in. <laughs> I don't know. But um, so uh, um, so that's part of what I think accounts for the difference. Um, but beyond that, it's a little hard to judge because um, 
the state of nature seems to have changed between the discourse and the social contract. Um, the situation in which the original compact or covenant that forms the state uh, is made seems to be different. Um, So, um, I mean, Rousseau says here what he didn't really agree to in the social, in the discourse on inequality. He, but here he seems to agree with Locke and Hobbes that there's this initial, I mean, I shouldn't say that. In the discourse, there is a kind of initial agreement. It's just that one of the parties is fooled into it, <laughs> right? But in any case, uh, but, but here there's an initial agreement that everyone rationally agrees to, um, and it has to be unanimous, and it ends the state of nature, and it precedes all other legislation, even the most fundamental legislation. So, so far we're in agreement with Locke and Hobbes. But there's Rousseau in the social contract gives a completely different explanation than Locke or Hobbes gives and seemingly very different from the one he himself gives in the discourse on inequality about why this happens. So this is book one, chapter six, 163 where this starts to happen and it starts out I suppose that men have reached the point where obstacles that are harmful to their maintenance in the state of nature gain the upper hand by their resistance to the forces that each individual can bring to bear to maintain himself in that state. Such being the case, that original state cannot subsist any longer, and the human race would perish if it did not alter its mode of existence. So, um, So first of all, like it's not clear what stage in this is happening at in the list of stages in the discourse. It doesn't seem exactly possible at any of them. Like, so in the pure state of nature of the discourse, the original state of nature, um, people would not be able to make a compact. They have no idea of a compact and they have they they have no language and they have no foresight. So um, they're very far from being able to make a compact for any reason. Um, um, but on the other hand, it, it, it doesn't seem like the final state of nature that um, Rousseau discusses in the discourse, because, and it doesn't seem like the state of nature in Locke or Hobbes, because it seems like people here are peaceful and they're not afraid of each other. They're, they're, it's, it's some obstacle that each of them faces as an individual that they can't get over without the help of others. Right? The obstacles that are harmful to their maintenance in the state of nature gain the upper hand by their resistance to the forces that each individual can bring to bear to maintain himself in that state. It sounds like there's some kind of common obstacle that they're facing. Um, yeah. Could that common obstacle be like, when you get out of the state of nature, you have more money to live? Like the common obstacle is like, if it's a Well, but. I'm just trying to understand like, yeah. what the obstacle, what what is harmful to people's maintenance? And but it says, what's interesting is it's like, the most interesting part of that sense to me is that those obstacles at a point gain the upper hand. Yeah, so something has changed here. Yeah. 
Right. So I don't think, I mean, besides the fact that in the discourse, Rousseau denies that people didn't live as long as a state of nature, right? I mean, he says they didn't have medicine, but whoever showed that medicine makes people live longer. <laughs> well, like, as, and as I said, that is probably true for 18th century medicine. I, right? It probably didn't make people live longer. Um, so, um, but, um, but I mean, but part of that argument is uh, like, I think is, I mean, so like, it's, it's not true, of course, that having, you know, now that having advanced medicine doesn't increase life expectancy, but like part of what he says is true. I mean, we do have new diseases that we wouldn't have um, if we weren't living in so close to each other, or if we, you know, weren't so sedentary, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, um, but, uh, and yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't seem like that is the obstacle because it because that doesn't seem like it would suddenly change. It's, uh, he, he doesn't, like this is all he says about it. He doesn't give an example or anything, right? So I'm not sure what, I mean, I guess it's even possible that this obstacle means the obstacle of having to fight each other, but it doesn't sound like that. So, you know, I think maybe he's thinking there's some natural disaster, there's some external obstacle that suddenly arises. Um, or maybe he's thinking that their population has increased and they can no longer each uh, maintain themselves by hunting. I, I'm, I'm really not sure, but, but what I am sure is that um, um, this difference in imagining what the problem was in the state of nature completely changes the, um, well, it, you can tell, I think, I mean, this is kind of like a theme with all these, or maybe a theme with my discussion of all these people, that you can, you should be able to tell exactly what the terms of the social contract are going to be by figuring out what problem it's designed to solve. So if you understand what was bad about the state of nature, then you know what the compact must be like. And by changing the problem, so drastically, he's changed the possible solutions. Um, so in particular, so this is the way it changes it. So um, Well, okay, there's two different directions to come at this from, but I'm just gonna kind of combine them. I hope that's not too confusing. <laughs> um, I mean, well, maybe I should try to disentangle them better than I have in my notes here. So on the one hand, okay, so for Hobbes and Locke, the problem with the state of nature is other people's rights their exercise of their rights is dangerous to me, right? In Hobbes, it's this unlimited right, which is obviously dangerous to me. But even in Locke, so there's a much more limited right, a right to punish, right? Like to execute the law of nature. Um, but uh, that's, that's still a big problem for me that other people have that right because we don't necessarily agree on what the law of nature is or how it applies in a particular instance. Um, and there's no like published standing law we can consult. And there's no umpire, as Locke says, we can uh, appeal to in the case where we disagree. So it's going to be like um, pretty easy for wars to start. Even though the state of nature isn't a state of war, according to Locke, it's not hard for a war to get started in the state of nature. And once it's started, it's hard to end it. Um, so, um, 
So the problem, according to them, is going to be, okay, how can I get all those other people to lay down some of their rights so that they won't be so threatening to me? And in return for that, if I can be sure they're really going to do that, um, I should be willing to lay down some of my rights. And that's, what the, that's how the compact is going to work. So, you know, so on the one hand, um, Rousseau actually denies that that solution is possible. <laughs> um, right, he, because he denies that, I, that, that anyone actually can renounce their liberty and give up their rights. This is um, book one, chapter four on page 160. Renouncing one's liberty is renouncing, and this is an argument that I pointed out or at least claimed was already in Locke, but Rousseau is um, pursuing it much more consistently and taking it much farther. So, and this is the argument, renouncing one's liberty is renouncing one's dignity, dignity as a man, the rights of humanity, and even its duties. And a little bit farther down, taking away all liberty from his will is tantamount to removing all morality from his actions. I mean, those are two sentences out of a long like paragraph where he gives a million reasons why you can't do this. But I'm picking those out because I think, I don't know, they're the best reasons or, um, or the ones that go the farthest. I mean, I guess they're both statements of the same thing, right? That I, you know, although I might be able to waive my rights, you might think that I could always waive my rights. I can't waive my duties. And I need my rights to fulfill my duties. So I can't waive my rights. So, uh, um, So the solution that Hobbes and Locke think is available to their problem is not uh, available according to Rousseau. And, you know, therefore, I guess he, his conclusion about that problem is that it has no solution or it has no legitimate solution, right? And that is consistent with what he concludes in the discourse. There is no legitimate way. Once the state of once the problem with the state of nature is the is the state of war that we're in, there is no legitimate way out of it. Um, by legitimate, I mean there is no way out of it that everyone ought reasonably to agree to, because the people who are like, I think I can explain this maybe a little bit better than I did last time. Like the people who uh, are currently on the losing side, the poor. Um, I mean, so like they don't like this state of war either. They would rather have the war end, but they don't want it to end now. <laughs> they want it to end later after they've taken all the stuff away from the rich and they become the rich, then they want it to end, right? The people who want it to end now are the people who are rich now. So there's no like, agreement they can make, even though I, I think, you know, last time I said that the poor are worse off after this, and I'm not sure that's right or that you have to say that, but, but the, you know, this war is bad for everyone, but nevertheless, it's not rational for the poor to end it on these terms, on the only terms that are available. So, um, I mean, um, so there is a solution to their problem, but it's not a legitimate solution. Now, I, I guess the only thing that worries me is that it seems like I've given two reasons why there's no legitimate solution, and I'm not sure they're at all equivalent, <laughs> right? This reason in the social contract and, and that explanation I gave of what happens at the end of the discourse on inequality. But in any case, they do definitely agree with each other on that, namely that um, 
if what you're worried about in the state of nature is the threat to you from other human beings exerting their rights, there's no way for a social for a legitimate social contract to um, get you out of that. The only way out is by fraud. Um, and like the resulting state already has the seeds of its own destruction in it, basically. By destruction, I mean it's reduction to tyranny. Um, people are not looking happy about this. Is that a question? <laughs> Right, the reduction to, you know, I didn't say a lot about this in detail last time because I was rushing in the last or after the last minute. <laughs> that, you know, in the discourse, once the civil state starts, right, so this is the state of nature in a broad sense, and it ends with the war, the war of the rich versus the poor. The civil state starts, so it starts according to Rousseau just with laws. And he says, like, um, it's impossible to imagine that before there were laws, they already had the idea of people to enforce laws. So that he, that, that he says what they first did was just agree on certain laws, and they thought that would be enough. Right? Like this tricky rich person gave this speech about how we should all unite and respect each other's property and whatever. Um, and then they made some laws. Um, but after a while, they realized that, no, we need someone to enforce the laws. And that's when the idea of a government came up. But the first government, he says, was elected. That is, they just chose some people to do this by election. Um, but uh, after a while, that tends to degenerate into a hereditary government. It's still, it's still legal. Like these people still have their authority from the people, but they've been given the ability to pass it on to their descendants. Um, and then eventually they forget where their authority comes from. And they start to just trying to rule in their own interest as if the um, other people were their property for their use. Right. And that's that's the stage of tyranny. And like uh someday they'll invent a blackboard with a spell check in it. Yeah. Is it because um, he feels like the government um, went into something that's hereditary? And is that what led to the tyranny before? Yeah, I mean, that eventually leads to it. But, to, but to begin with, it's not, right? To begin with, these people are offices, officers of the state, and they're like executing the law that has been made by the people, but, they, but it's just like the same person the person who does that always does it and their descendants also do that. They stop having elections. But, but it leads to tyranny because it leads to them eventually forgetting why, thinking that this is like, this is hereditary because it's like their property. Um, and as I said at the end last time, I think reading between the lines, Rousseau is saying that this stage is the stage that 18th century France has reached. Right, so I mean, from this you could see why someone would would think that Rousseau, Rousseau's work somehow uh, sparked the French Revolution or inspired it or something. Um, um, right, I mean, he's saying like we were tricked into this to begin with. It was never set up right. Um, uh, it had this unauthorized inequality built in from the beginning. And now it's degenerated to the point where it's completely intolerable. And if you just consult your own reason, you'll see that you have every right to just do away with it. Um, but, um, um, right, so this is like the destruction of the state in the sense that at this point, there's no more commonwealth. 
It's just like a master and slave. There's, there's, there's no more law. Um, okay, so that's all in the discourse, but um, um, right, and I went into that because, as I was saying, so like this this uh, wrong way of setting up the state, according to uh, Rousseau, builds in the kind of problems that eventually is going to lead to this. So on the other hand, in this new state of nature, he's imagining where we're what we're afraid of is not each other, but something else. The question is um, how we can unite our forces without giving up any of our liberty. So um, that is, we have some common interest um, other than peace. There's something we all want. We all want to overcome this obstacle. And the question is now not how to limit each other, but how to like coordinate. <laughs> so our, with our forces together, we can overcome this obstacle and other obstacles without giving up our liberty. Um, as he says, um, Book two, chapter one. Oh, I might not be able to find this because it looks like I didn't write down a page number for some reason. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, or if the opposition of private interests made necessary the establishment of societies. It is the accord of these same interests that make it possible. It is what these different interests have in common that forms the social bond. And were there no point of agreement among all the, these interests, no society could exist. Right, so there's, there's like some common uh, aim here. So the question, the problem they face is um, um, I can't find that passage, but here's one that's probably even better on the next page. On page 164, book one, chapter six. Oh, this was one I was looking for, actually. It's also on 164. But since each man's force and liberty are the primary instruments of his maintenance, how is he going to entrust them to others without hurting himself and without neglecting the care that he owes himself? This difficulty, seen in terms of my subject, can be stated in the following terms. Find a form of association that defends and protects with all common forces the person and goods of each associate, and by means of which each one, while uniting with all, nevertheless obeys only himself and remains as free as before. That's the problem. So it's a so it's uh, that, and again, I think that problem is created. The problem is put in those terms because he's imagining the state of nature differently. In this state, I don't have any reason to lay down my rights. That's not what I want. I don't want other people to lay down their rights. What I want is for us all to coordinate together to join our forces. Um, uh, 
Um, so like before, actually before he even sets up the problem the way I just said it, and, and certainly before he gives his solution, Rousseau first considers some other ways that you could justify civil society. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not going to go into the details of this because it's, it's mostly, it's partly in response to Hobbes and also this guy, uh, Hugo Grotius. Uh, I think we've seen people refer to him before. I think maybe uh, Locke refers to him somewhere. States are 1583 to 1645. So, uh, you know, he was pretty famous for having written a book about the law of nations. Um, um, the law of war and peace, I guess it's called. Um, uh, Rousseau doesn't have much time for him. He's probably being unfair to him. I think he's definitely being unfair to Hobbes in certain ways. Um, and the arguments that Rousseau makes in this area are kind of confusing. But I do want to call attention to one thing in that, um, in that part, which is the chapter on the right of the strongest. So um, where he says, so this is on page 159, force is a physical power. I fail to see what morality can result from its effects. To give in to force is an act of necessity, not of will. At most it is an act of prudence. In what sense could it be a duty? So, um, Hobbes and Locke both are going to say, um, you can't take apart necessity and duty. Right? Like, it is vain to suppose a duty in, in, in Locke's terminology, it is vain to suppose a duty without necessity. That is, there must be some bad consequence that I foresee <laughs> from uh, uh, violating a certain law, and that's what makes obeying the law my duty. Um, whereas Rousseau comes back against this by claiming that I can be free um, I can be free of external necessity, at least, so to speak if the necessity I'm submitting to is the principle of my own rational will. Um, so like um, the, the person giving the command <laughs> that I have to obey is myself, seen in another respect. That is um, uh, myself as like active, providing a principle to which facts must conform, that self is stronger than myself as a passive. It, that's the state in which I'm free, according to Rousseau. So, I mean, uh, um, So it's that, like, let's say there's a, a new, a new understanding of the way freedom is related to law. Like, so according to Hobbes, like freedom and law are opposites of each other, right? Freedom, like the freedom of the subject is the area where the, where the law doesn't constrain the subject. According to Locke, um, freedom and law are necessary for each other, but it's still, um, it, it works like this, that the law 
um, opens up a space in which I can do whatever I want by keeping everyone else out. Um, and on both those understandings, the freedom is uh, um, um, the freedom is still like uh, what's what the law leaves over. But according to Rousseau, uh, the freedom is going to turn out to be the effect of giving a law to myself. So like, I mean, so first of all, if you're like, if you know anything about Kant's ethics, this, that would sound familiar. This is right, this is gonna be Kant's understanding of freedom. Um, so I think, you know, uh, you can see why Kant would have said, or you can start to see why Kant would have said that Rousseau uh, was to the moral world what Newton was to the physical world. Right, like Rousseau, as opposed to Hobbes or Locke, according to Kant, has the right understanding of how law and freedom are related to each other. Um, um, and it's because uh, The reason I'm only free when I'm giving a law to myself is that when I'm not giving a law to myself, I'm a slave to my inclinations. Right? I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm not deciding rationally what to do. Of course, I use reason to figure out the means for what I want. But I'm not deciding rationally what to do. I'm ultimately I'm just like going after the things that attract me. So I'm a, so I'm passive with respect to that, and I'm just I'm a slave. Um, so Rousseau is saying that to reach a situation where uh, I'm really free, there has to, I have to be able to um, separate my reason from my from my like um, passive desires and use it to give myself a command. Again, people are not looking happy about this. Maybe, well, I mean, so like the way this works out in Kant is, is really uh, subtle and complicated, but that's, I mean, that I think is one of the reasons that this book is interesting because, um, Rousseau is working out a more limited, but like version of this, but a version that doesn't involve all the metaphysical machinery that Kant needs to, to make sense of it. Um, um, so anyway, like that's that, that was the thing I wanted to point out in chapter three. By the end of chapter three, we've concluded that um, a legitimate society is not natural. That's the kind of like explanation he's ruled out basically. And, um, and in chapter four on slavery is basically aimed at ruling out Hobbes's commonwealth by acquisition. Um, although in the process, he also argues even against Locke that um, the victor in a just war, he says, doesn't have a right to kill the combatants and therefore doesn't have a right to enslave them. Um, as soon as they lay down their arms, they're no longer enemies. Um, so in any case, that's the conclusion of chapter four. So, so chapter two and chapter three show that we can't have a legitimate society naturally and chapter four says we can't be forced into it so this so the only thing that remains is we have to make a compact and then you know when he starts talking about that that's the beginning of that is what i started out by reading i suppose men have reached the point where the obstacles so like the only legitimate way of forming a society is to make some kind of compact and 
one way to put this is the situation Rousseau has to imagine to make a, such a compact possible is this really special situation. Men have reached the point where the obstacles that are harmful to their maintenance, et cetera, right? That is a situation where people have a reason to leave the state of nature, but it's not each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm still confused on where, uh, I mean, because like, I, I mean, I understand he's sort of moving away from like the discourse on equality. So like, there's these like different stages in the state of nature, like the original, like we call it the primitive and then the savage state. You know? And in the savage state, like, there is like the sort of inequality on it. There is like conflict. There is war. Like it seems like you know, there is reason, you know, for humans to fear each other uh, in that state of nature. But it seems like if, you, if he's disregarding that as a reason to leave the state of nature, you know, it must be like some other. I don't know. I, I don't really understand like what state of nature Rousseau is like talking about here now. Yeah. Well, so I mean, like I said, and I'm going to come back to try to explain this. It is really hard to place this in his list of stages in the discourse. Now, I mean, of course, it's like I said, it's three years later. It's always possible he doesn't believe in the list of stages in the discourse. Or given what kind of person Rousseau is, it's possible that, you know, he wrote the discourse, like he had this idea for how to write it. He wrote it out, it was finished, and then like kind of forget about it. And then he's like, has a new idea to write something else. And there's no consistency between them. It's possible, but, but I don't think it's necessary to say that. So, but anyway, but, it, but, it, but, but there is a problem if you try to put them together because yeah, you got the pure state of nature. And, you know, there's a couple, there's more stages in here, but somewhere in here is the savage, what I call the savage stage. But remember, that's, that's my terminology. It's not Rousseau's terminology, but it's based on what he says about savages. So, um, so, you know, the problem is this, that as you're saying, it seems like on the one hand, we have to be talking about the pure state of nature because we're talking about a state where people are not each other's enemies. Um, uh, but on the other hand, oh, I see that this is kind of off. Uh, on the other hand, we're talking about a state where people can make a compact. Well, when can people make a compact? Well, in the discourse, it's only like once agriculture is invented that people have enough foresight to do things like make compacts. So, um, so it seems like we're talking about some strange situation. But um, without yet trying to say exactly what the strange situation is, it's like maybe not surprising that we're talking about a strange situation. That's kind of what I was trying to get at the last thing I said. Like um, Rousseau concludes that there can only be a legitimate society by compact. And then he tries to imagine, okay, what would things have to be like to make that compact possible? And if you say, well, that's really unlikely, Rousseau, he'll say it is unlikely and that's why it's almost never happened, <laughs> right? That's why most societies are illegitimate. Um, um, so anyway, like, Given all those those presuppositions, then, um, as I said, the problem is, uh, how can I, what is a form of association that will allow us to stand together and defend each other and each other's property, but in such a way that we don't give up any of our liberty? So like Hobbes and Locke's commonwealths are, just, are not gonna work for this purpose because the whole point of them is to get everyone to agree to obey someone other than themselves, <laughs> um, right? There's like, uh, um, there's, uh, unanimous act that starts the commonwealth, but the unanimous act is that we agree 
to obey whoever the majority is going to appoint as the sovereign or the legislator. And then, you know, once that unanimous um, agreement is reached, we then vote. And that's basically the first and only act of the assembled people. After that, all their rights have been given up to the sovereign or the legislative power in law. Well, in Locke, there's, you know, um, there's some kind of special situations where the like rule might revert to the people as a whole, but they're basically either situations where they stipulated that originally, right? Like we're going to obey this person as long as he's alive, and then we're going to elect a new one or something like that. Or if somehow the society is dissolved, right? Because the government, you know, like uh, goes so against its purposes that um, that it's no longer a government. So, um, and, and of course, according to Hobbes, like that can't happen easily. The only way it can be resolved is if the society is destroyed, <laughs> right? Like the sovereign can no longer protect us. Um, but that doesn't reconstitute the assembly of the people. On the contrary, at that point, there is no people. Everyone is on their own again. So, um, so basically those like exceptions aside, this is the last time that the people do anything according to Hobbes or Locke. After that, it's just a matter of obeying the person they set up. Um, so, um, so Rousseau wants to find a way of doing this without having to agree some, to obey someone other than myself. Now, and that at this point, a really weird thing happens <laughs> because you might expect then that for this solution, that this solution is going to be one where. Um, uh, like the problem with Locke and Hobbes is that they wanted me to give away too much. And I have to find a way not to give it away. But instead, Rousseau says that the solution, the way to form a society without giving up our liberty is for everyone to give up everything to the society. <laughs> Right, this is so. This is uh, farther down on page 164. Um, he says, you know, this, this contract is going to have to have certain clauses. But then he says, these clauses, properly understood, are all reducible to a single one. Namely, the total alienation of each associate together with all of his rights to the entire community. Um, now, how, how, is, how is giving up all my rights to the community, a way of forming an association without giving up any of my liberty. It sounds like the opposite, right? So this is the way he explains it a little bit farther down the page. And you know, these things are all from the same page, right? So at the top of the page, he says, the problem is how I can form an association without giving up any of my liberty, because I can't give up my liberty. And then he says, like in the basically the next paragraph, he says, so the solution is for me to renounce all my rights and give them all up to the community. And how is that a solution? Um, since there is no associate over whom, oh, sorry, finally in giving himself to all, each person gives himself to no one. And since there is no associate over whom he does not acquire the same rights that he would grant others over himself, 
he gains the equivalent of everything he loses, along with a greater amount of force to preserve what he has. So that explanation, I mean, I think that is Rousseau's explanation, but it needs some interpretation to make sense of it. I mean, it sounds like it's um, either just wrong or it's some kind of trick, you know? I mean, yeah, I've given up my rights to, to everyone. And so I haven't given up my rights to anyone in particular. Um, and since I'm part of everyone, everyone else has given up their rights to me. <laughs> so like kind of mathematically speaking, so to speak, like I still have the same amount of right that I had before. Like my right has been split up among everyone, but meanwhile, everyone else's right has been split up among everyone. So I got like as much right as I lost. <laughs> But of course, like uh, if you just put it that way, I mean, it, it seems to make sense as a, you know, as a kind of equation or something, but it's like, wait, hold on a second. It's not the same right. I mean, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's the same thing at all. So um, like to see why Rousseau would say it really is the same thing. First of all, you have to, um, and this is probably the most important and strangest move in the whole book that, um, so, I mean, there are still, still gonna be two stages in forming the Commonwealth according to Rousseau, but they're not the same two stages. Locke and Hobbes's first two stages are not separate according to Rousseau. So Locke and Hobbes two stages were like the first one was agreed to form a community. Or maybe I should say to form a commonwealth. Maybe you have to say agree to incorporate, right? Like to form a body politic. Um, and this is unanimous. So this is Hobbes and Locke, right? this is not Rousseau. And this has to be unanimous because like whoever isn't, doesn't, isn't part of this agreement is not part of the Commonwealth that's coming into existence. Um, and then the second stage is Hughes, the, and depending whether we're talking about Hobbes or Locke, we're talking about choosing the sovereign and choosing the legislator. But I mean, so, uh, you know, this uh, Hobbes sovereign is not the same as Locke's legislator, but nevertheless, this stage is kind of the same thing, right? We're deciding who's going to give commands. It's just that, you know, Locke's legislative can't give any old commands. It can only make laws. Um, so, and this is by majority. So, um, so right here in this stage, first of all, I'm already obeying someone other than myself because I'm a, because if I'm in the minority, I have to obey the majority. And second of all, as I said before, I'm setting up someone who in the future I'm gonna to have to obey rather than myself. So uh, there's no more room on the board. I mean, there's more room on the board, but there's no more room on the screen. I guess I would have just yeah, yeah, you just heard it. Um, According to Rousseau, there's just one stage, and it's agree to become the sovereign and the state. There's no other choice to be made. That is, the assembly of the people is the sovereign. 
So the people who are reaching this unanimous agreement, and this has to be unanimous for the same reason that has to be unanimous. The people who are reaching this agree, uh, unanimous agreement to form a political entity, a state or commonwealth, um, are at the same time, the same people are agreeing that they are going to be the sovereign in this new entity. So for, so first of all, it's it's important to always remember that this is what Rousseau means by sovereign in the social contract. The sovereign is always the assembly of the whole people. Because sometimes he talks about the sovereign as if it were a person. I mean, it is a person, according to him. It's a legal person, right? But he talks about the sovereign as if it were an individual a human being. And, you know, especially coming from Hobbes, that, you know, it's, it'd be easy to, like, misunderstand that but the sovereign according to him is always the assembly of the whole people and of course the state that the sovereign rules over is also always the assembly of the whole people it's so the assembly of the whole people has um like two different roles it actually has a third role too that we'll talk about next time but um but this is enough to understand what he's saying this time so, um, and he says, like, um, it has to keep meeting. It has to keep meeting regularly. So, um, so, like, the commonwealth that's being being set up here is not going to look very much like the commonwealths that we mostly have right it's going to be a commonwealth where all the citizens regularly meet and make the laws um so i mean like in that sense well i mean we'll see rousseau is going to distinguish between different forms of government but um, the different forms of government, as far as like who is the supreme power, are all the same. They're all pure democracies. The difference is going to be in terms of like the magistrates or uh, that are appointed, like who those are going to be. Um, So, I mean, this like this sort of starts to make it at least a little bit clearer what's what's going on when he says that I'm not losing anything. Um, I'm uh, when I say I'm getting a piece of everyone else's right, that means like um, literally every time we have we make a decision, I get to vote on what we're gonna do. So, and I have as much vote as they do. So, like, um, um, I get to decide about them just as much as they get to decide about me. Um, but that's like still not enough, I think, to explain what he really thinks is happening here. Um, So in any case, what this means is that the, 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 the contract that we make is really like, it's between the people and themselves. Um, and it's like, it's between, I think this is something that Hobbes thinks is impossible, but Rousseau thinks it's the essence of this agreement that the parties to the agreement are created by the agreement. <laughs> right, like Hobbes thinks, Hobbes uses that as an argument against the idea that the uh, covenant that starts the Commonwealth is a contract between the people and the sovereign. 
he says it can't be because before the Commonwealth is formed, the people don't have a common, uh, there's no, uh, there's no, co there's no representative of all the people. So the people can't make an agreement. Um, and then after the Commonwealth is formed, it's too late because the sovereign represents them. Um, but Rousseau is saying that the way this agreement works is that, um, that the agreement is going to be an agreement between the sovereign and the state. And the sovereign and the state are both corporate entities. And they both exist only because of the agreement. <laughs> and they're both, they both have the same members. <laughs> but their members uh, like are appear in them in different roles. Um, so, you know, so like it's worth paying attention this kind of um, pedantic sounding thing he says on page 165 towards the end of chapter six, that it takes the name Republic or body politic, which is called state by its members when it is passive, sovereign when it is active. And as for the associates, they collectively take the name people. Individually, they are called citizens insofar as they are participants in the sovereign authority and subjects insofar as they are subjected to the laws of the state, right? So the sovereign is the body of all the citizens and the state is the body of all the subjects. But the subjects and the citizens are the same people. <laughs> um, or as he says, this is the beginning of chapter seven, farther down on 165. Each individual contracting as it were with himself finds himself under a twofold commitment, namely as a member of the sovereign towards private individuals and as a member of the state towards the sovereign. Um, So, um, so like the, the commitment as a member of the sovereign, that is as a citizen, is to um, consider the interests of all the subjects, their common interest, act in their common interest. The, the, commitment as a member of the state, that is, as, as a subject, is to obey the decisions of the sovereign. Um, and Rousseau says, the maxim of civil law that no one is held to commitments made to himself cannot be applied here, for there is a considerable difference between being obligated to oneself or to a whole of which one is part. So I think like that actually goes both directions. That is, each citizen um, is obligated to the state as a whole of which the citizen is a part. And each subject is obligated to the sovereign as a whole of which the subject is a part. I mean, that is the subject is not a part qua subject, but qua citizen, and like citizen is not a part qua citizen, but qua subject. But that's, um, that's, the, that's what allows each individual to make a contract with themselves. Um, they're making a contract as individual with themselves as a part of, uh, um, with a whole of which they as individuals are parts. Um, But there still is a kind of asymmetry here. Um, um, so, uh, because Rousseau says that the sovereign on the one hand can only act in the common interest, 
I mean, he hasn't really explained why that's true yet. I'll talk about it in a moment. But he says the, the sovereign doesn't need any um, check on it to make sure that it acts in the common interest. So that is, the citizens as citizens are automatically going to vote for the common interest. But the subjects as subjects are not automatically going to obey what the sovereign says. Um, this is on page 166. The sovereign, by the mere fact that it exists, is always all that it should be. But the same thing cannot be said of the subjects in relation to the sovereign, for whom, despite their common interest, their commitments would be without substance if it did not find ways of being assured of their fidelity. In fact, each individual can, as a man, have a private will contrary to or different from the general will that he has as a citizen. His private interest can speak to him in an entirely different manner than the common interest. Right? So this same individual here, as a citizen, is a member of the sovereign and um, can only express the common interests. But as a subject, a member of the state, there's a potential conflict between this person's private interest and the common interest. Now, I mean, if you ask why is there a difference, I think that like um, the thing that needs to be explained is why as a citizen, they can only consult the common interest. This part is easy to understand, that they have a private interest that might be different from the interest of the state. Um, so, I mean, so given that, um, um, the, the sovereign is going to need to have means to ensure that the subjects fulfill its commands, right? That is, it's going to have to be an executive. Um, Whereas the state doesn't is not going to need means of ensuring that the sovereign acts in its interest. Um, and um, so to come back to the nature of freedom and how it's related to law here in a little bit more detail, um, it's for this individual. As citizen, they're committed to ensuring that all the subjects obey the law, including themselves. So there's like two standpoints you can see the same person from. One is as a person who's a slave to their inclinations, right? As, um, this is the bottom of page 167, where he's talking about what, what we get out of forming a commonwealth. And at the end, he says, to the proceeding could be added the acquisition in the civil state of moral liberty, which alone makes man truly the master of himself. For to be driven by appetite alone is slavery, and obedience to the law one has prescribed for oneself is liberty. Then he says, but I have already said too much on this subject and the philosophical meaning of the word liberty is not part of my subject here. All right, so unfortunately he doesn't say more about this, but he says enough, right? So what he's saying is that um, like as opposed to in a state of nature where all I have is my own appetites and I'm a slave to them, in this state, um, I still have my appetites looked at from one point of view, but looked at from another point of view as a citizen, I have um, like, um, I'm a rational lawgiver giving the law to myself and everyone else. And if myself as rational lawgiver is stronger than myself as slave to appetites, then I'm free. 
now I've right that is now I'm uh, not doing whatever something drives me to do, but I'm doing what I've rationally decided I should do. Now, like I said, like unlike in Kant, there's no, I mean, Rousseau does, remember he said to begin with that he thinks that humans have a faculty of free will. He doesn't really explain how to get around the paradoxes of that or whatever, right? But, um, but you know, here in this place, there's no, I mean, there's nothing about what I just said that's, um, uh, There's nothing about what I just said that 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 makes this person be like an originator of actions, you know, independent of physical causal chain or something like that. It's not at that level that it gets to in Kant, but nevertheless, it's the same idea that's going to turn up in Kant. That you know, I can I can be seen in one sense as commanding and in the other sense as obeying, and that's the way I can be free. Um, so, in the, and it's the compact is necessary to create this situation, according to you said. So, I mean, according to Kant, there isn't going to be a compact necessary to create this situation because we're all already citizens of the kingdom of ends. <laughs> Um, and we don't have to choose an executor because God is already the executor in the kingdom of ends. But um, according to Rousseau, to set up this situation, we have to make the compact. Um, the compact creates the relation in which each of us qua passive, like I qua passive ought to obey myself qua active. So I, qua subject, ought to obey myself, qua citizen. In the state of nature, there's no such thing. There's, in the state of nature, there's no way of saying um, you shouldn't have that appetite that you have. You have it, and that's what you're going to act on. OK, so, but I mean, this is great that in this like kind of abstract way I'm free, but we still have, I think, have a question like, okay, but once you've said all of that, aren't I still in a situation where um, I've given up all my rights to the sovereign and now, okay, fine, I'm a member of the sovereign, but I'm only one member of the sovereign. Um, What's to stop the sovereign from coming around tomorrow and, um, you know, like this is exactly what happens with Hobbes's sovereign. I agree to give up all my rights to the sovereign. And um, tomorrow the sovereign could come around and say like, oh, nice house you have here. I heard you gave up all your rights to me. I think I'm going to move into your house. <laughs> and, you know, so like, of course, this sovereign can't quite do that because this sovereign isn't an individual human being. They can't live in my house. It's the assembly of the people. But still, I mean, you can imagine that the assembly of the people is going to um, somehow take all my property away for common purposes and leave me with nothing. Um, and of course, I'm not going to agree to that, but it's too late for me to disagree because everyone else is now ganged up against me. Um, so, um, The solution to that is, and again, it's something that we saw in Locke, but, or at least that I claimed was in Locke, but that, um, um, 
but that again, Rousseau like takes it farther and pursues it more consistently. Um, I mean, it's interesting that I keep saying that about Rousseau. Like one of the first things I said about Rousseau is that he's not necessarily as consistent as Hobbes or Locke, but in some way, I guess he's more consistent. Um, but so in any case, there's like, um, um, a list of things that the sovereign can't do. There's limits on what the sovereign can do. And um, the limits are uh, for the most part, not things that need someone to enforce them exactly. So like the first limit is this, he says this already in book one, chapter seven, that the law, the sovereign can't make a law, can't impose a, a law upon itself that it could not break. So, okay, I mean, that's, right? So in other words, the sovereign can't make a law like, like the assembly of Athens once made, you know, um, no one can propose that we invade what was it, Salamis or I don't know, something, <laughs> right? They can't, uh, they can't say like, okay, in the future um, that we won't be able to break this law because the sovereign tomorrow has the right to make a law saying, no, we will break that law, right? So, I mean, again, that's not like something that has to be enforced. Um, it's just like the sovereign literally can't do it. Um, another thing he says also on page 166 is that um, the sovereign can't um, obligate itself, not even to another power, to do anything that derogates from the original act, such as alienating some portion of itself or submitting to another sovereign. So, right, so like um, the sovereign can't say, you know what, we don't need all these subjects. You, you, you know, you can have some of them. <laughs> um, and, or the sovereign can't say, oh, you know, we don't want to be sovereign anymore. We're going to like subject ourselves to someone else. Um, now, in this in this case, it doesn't need enforcement. I think in a different sense, because if the sovereign does one of those things, it's no longer the sovereign of the state that it was the sovereign of. There might be a new state, <laughs> but it's not the one that was there before. Um, and you know, uh, like Rousseau is going to say, and this is important. Um, it's important partly for understanding what he thinks about Sparta. He says that like, um, what happens in a state where the government becomes tyrannical and takes over? So like, you know, we started off with this, but now somehow the government has gotten out of control. The government is like the magistrates that the sovereign is gonna appoint. So he, he says, this is um, later on in book two, he says that in that case, what happens is that the Commonwealth contracts and the new Commonwealth is the government of the old Commonwealth. And the new citizens are the members of the government of the old Commonwealth. And the, the citizens of the old Commonwealth are now slaves to the new Commonwealth. Right, so like that, I think is how we understand Sparta. There's a like there's a Commonwealth like this, not maybe exactly like this, but anyway, close enough for his purposes. There's you know there's a Commonwealth like this. It doesn't comprise everyone in Lacedaemonia, right? It doesn't. It it, it only includes the Spartans, that is the citizens of Sparta. Mm -hmm. 
the helots, which is most people are not included, but that doesn't prevent it from being a perfectly legitimate state. It's just a state that holds lots of slaves. Now, I mean, it's true that in chapter four, he tried to show that no one can ever be legitimately made a slave. And so there's been when kind of confronted with the fact that, yeah, okay, so maybe it's a free state, but it's doing something you shouldn't. He says something evasive, as we'll see. But in any case, I think that's how he understands what happens in Sparta. So, so again, like, you know, if the sovereign does something that goes against the fundamental agreement that set it up, then it's just no longer as a sovereign, although there might, something new might come into existence. Um, and another rule is that um, the sovereign can't appoint someone else to represent its will. Um, okay, so this is in book two, chapter one. I therefore maintain that since sovereignty is merely the exercise of the general will, it can never be alienated, and that the sovereign, which is only a collective being, cannot be represented by anything but itself. Power can perfectly well be transferred, but not the will. Why is it the will can't be transferred? I mean, because first of all, the whole idea in Hobbes and Locke was for my will to be transferred to my agent, basically. And Rousseau is saying that can't happen. Why can't it happen? Um, in fact, while it is not impossible for a private will to be in accord, on, in accord with on some point with the general will, to be in accord on some point with the general will, it is impossible at least for this accord to be durable and constant. For by its nature, the private will tends towards giving advantages to some and not to others and the general will tends towards equality. It is even more impossible for there to be a guarantee of this accord, even if it ought always to exist. This accord is not the result of art, but of chance, right? So he's saying like in general, I mean, I think it applies to this case, but I think he thinks it's in general, it's true. Someone else can't represent my will because um, although things can be set up, um in in such a way or can by you know by chance fall out in such a way that someone's will happens to agree with mine i can't um, um there's nothing i can do to ensure that their will will always agree with mine so if it does agree sometimes it's by accident Right? The sovereign may well say, right now I want what a certain man wants, or at least what he says he wants, but it cannot say what this man will want tomorrow, I too will want. So that's why the sovereign always has to remain the assembly of the people, right? That's why this two-stage process is impossible, according to Rousseau. Um, the the, you know, the people get together and say, we're gonna have a common will. And according to Hobbes and Locke, the first thing they do is say, and so-and-so is gonna represent our common will. But Rousseau says, no one can represent the will. So that second stage never happens. So the sovereign is always the assembly of the people. Um, again, this is something that like, um, the sovereign literally can't do, right? I mean, they can say what so-and-so is going to will tomorrow will be our will, but they can't make it true that what so-and-so is going to will tomorrow will be their will. So the act, like, doesn't work. Um, you know, like if what happens as a result is that tomorrow they all start doing what this other person says against their will, well, they shouldn't have done that, right? But it wasn't like the sovereign didn't do it, basically. 
So um, the last limit, though, that I'm going to talk about is the most important one. And this is the one where some question in my mind comes up about what's going to enforce it. I mean, well, let me say what it is first. Um, so, I mean, this is what, sorry, I kind of introduced this too early. This is the thing that we already saw in Locke and not at all in Hobbes, but that Rousseau carries out more clearly and consistency, consistently. And the principle is that the sovereign can't act um, in regard to any individual or any individual case. They can only make universal laws. Um, right, so this is explained basically in chapter four of book two on the limits of sovereign power. Um, And for some reason, I couldn't write down a page number. But, oh, here it is. Why is the general will always right? And why do all constantly want the happiness of each of them? If not because everyone applies the word each to himself and thinks of himself as he votes for all. When we vote on something that's going to apply to each of us, we each think of ourselves as the each. <laughs> so we're all voting on a law that's going to apply to ourselves. Um, so, um, so we're not going to vote on something that's harmful to each of us, because that would be voting for something that's harmful to ourselves. So what's the way out of that? How can I make sure that I'm not voting for something that's harmful to each of us? I have to vote for something that's in our common interest. Um, right, so as he goes on to say, um, this proves that the equality of right and the notion of justice it produces are derived from the preference each person gives himself and thus from the nature of man. That the general will to be really such must be general in its object as well as in its essence, that it must derive from all in order to be applied to all, and that it loses its natural rectitude when it tends towards any individual determinate object. Right, so as soon as the vote is not about something that's gonna to apply to each of us, but, a, but about someone that's gonna to apply to Abe, then, most people who are voting are not thinking of themselves, but they're thinking of me. <laughs> and of course, there's you know uh, no guarantee that they won't want to do something that's harmful to me. So um, so it's the same thing that Locke concluded about the legislative, only stronger, and it has like a really um, strong argument in favor of it, that the sovereign, it's completely illegitimate for the sovereign to make any laws that apply to particular people or um, to decide any particular cases. Um, and this is why, like, at least as long as this is observed, I think it's really true that I haven't given up my own property, right? So like, you know, here's the territory of the state. Again, Rousseau uh, doesn't explain very well. He also, I mean, he brings up the problem, but or like in passing, how the state gets to have territory. He even says that it's like, 
it's a kind of an innovation of modern monarchies that the monarchs think of themselves as rulers of territory rather than people, right? So he does some pay some attention to it, but all he says to explain how it happens is the same thing that Locke says, that people come into the Commonwealth with property and then it gets joined up. Um, he doesn't explain how the Commonwealth ends up having public you know, territory that no one's living on or whatever. Um, but in any case, so here's my property within the territory of the Commonwealth. So like, um, do I still have the property rights I had to it in the state of nature or not? Well, um, you know, in one sense, I've given up the whole right to it to the to the sovereign. But um, the sovereign can't use that right it, with respect to my property in particular. So we can't say, you know, here's the new law, Abe's property is going to be taken away. <laughs> right? That's, that, that's something the sovereign can't say. And it's, it, it can't say it because it's not an expression of the general will. And right, Rousseau says explicitly, I mean, of course, this is cheating. I knew what Rousseau was going to say and what Kant was going to say when I said this about Locke. But this is saying explicitly what I argued in the case of Locke, that a general or public will is, as Rousseau puts it, it's general in its object, not just in its essence. The general will only wills general things. It doesn't will, will particular things. So the sovereign, as, as expressing a general will, can't say anything about my particular piece of land. So, I mean, it could say we're going to take away everyone's land. Um, but that will only happen if a majority of the citizens vote for it. A majority of the citizens uh, normally would not vote for that because it would mean taking away their land too. Um, so uh, um, what about if there's some special case where it's an emergency and the citizens do vote that everyone should give up their land? Well, then um, um, that's a case where as I ought to agree, my, you know, my land and everyone else's land has to be like used for the common interest to preserve the society. So it's, um, um, but I mean, like even in that case, of course, that doesn't mean that everyone's land is gonna be given to someone else. Right, like you can't, you know, the sovereign can't say everyone's land is now gonna belong to A. It's going to say something like it could say something like, "No one can keep people from crossing their land," <laughs> or something like that. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to lose the right to keep people from crossing my land, but I'm going to gain the right to cross everyone else's land. And as um, I ought to agree, as and as the majority has determined. Um, it's like that change is necessary for the public interests. So in other words, the sovereign has no private interest of its own that competes with mine and it can't directly interfere with mine. Um, it can only like interfere with it insofar as it does the same to everyone and in a case where we, we agree that it's the common interest to do it. So I really do basically still have the right to my property. That's, I, I think, is the full explanation of why Rousseau says I haven't given anything up, although I've, in a sense, I've given everything up. Um,
Now, like I said, the question is, you know, um, okay, what if the sovereign, as for example, the assembly did in Athens, starts uh, starts making laws about particular people and interfering in particular cases. Um, oops, I see I'm actually out of time. Um, I mean, again, you could say, well, when it does that, it's not acting as the sovereign anymore. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily a big comfort to me if, if my land is taken away, right? The, the question is, how is it safe to enter this state? Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the answer to that is. The other thing is that everything I just said about voting, as Rousseau himself admits, um, it only works as long as everyone votes independently. But if suppose a bunch of people get together first and decide on a particular common interest as against the rest of ours, so they have like kind of a primary election, right? That's what Rousseau calls a faction. And what in fact the founding fathers in the United States called a faction. Um, so in that case, like, um, there's like a bunch of little private interests. Each of one has one vote. And then there's a big private interest that has lots of votes. And the bigger that is, the more likely it is that it's gonna be able to like um, get the sovereign to do things that are in its interests and not in everyone else's. Um, so all Rousseau says about that is that's terrible and it shouldn't, you know, we should design the society so it won't happen. <laughs> um, okay, there was a couple other things I wanted to talk about actually, but I guess I'll get to them next time. I hope there'll be more people there then. Um, and yeah, I'll see you then.